Let's start off with Philippians 3, 17 through 21. Today we're going to talk about uh, a topic that uh, seems to re be reserved sometimes. We uh, neglect it and don't talk about it much, but it's very relevant. Uh, and that's why I wanted to talk about Philippians 3, 17 through 21. Brethren, that includes sister. <laughs> join. <laughs> you have to pronounce that correctly. <laughs> Sister. <laughs> well, ain't that a spit? Anyway, <laughs> brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. We who are born again from above, those of us who have accepted, believed, and confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, born again, that's what that means, uh, we know we're on our way to heaven, or we should know. If you don't know that, uh, let me encourage you. You are. you are. Once you were born again, once you started on this journey, you began eternal life. There's a transition that's going to happen. Right, and you'll continue on, but you are on your way to heaven. You don't have to doubt it. You don't have to question it. Jesus paid the price for that to happen. Can somebody say amen? amen. Yeah, and he did. So, but even, even knowing that, we still have questions about what's heaven going to be like. What is heaven? And, because that's our home. That, that's what scripture teaches us. We're just tourists traveling through. We've talked about that many times, but heaven is our home. So it makes us curious, what's it going to be like? We wonder uh, even about our loved ones who have gone on before us and what they may or may not have experienced. And I know I've shared this before, but I think it's, it's, it's good to share things to remember. Uh, well, right after my dad passed, that very next night, uh, I had a dream that he called me on my cell phone from heaven. Remember we talked about this? And, and uh, you know, I remember looking at my cell phone and, and in my dream thinking, man, that's a long distance. <laughs> you know, and answered the phone and, and my dad, I remember him saying, they let me call you and I just wanted to tell you that heaven is not at all what we think it is. Love you, goodbye. And I, I've, you know, how many years has it been? I've even lost count of the years. You know, uh, but I still remember that thinking that, and I woke up with the feeling that it must be so, it's so far beyond wonderful, so far beyond any vocabulary we could possibly express. We're, we're given some clues, and we'll go over some of those clues today, uh, and I've got a lot of scripture references. Uh, we'll, go, we'll read a lot of them, but it must be so wonderful that we really, it's not at all what we could even imagine. Uh, as it's written in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we are looking in a mirror that gives only a dim, blurred reflection of reality as in a riddle or enigma. But then when perfection comes, we shall see in reality and face to face. Now I know in part, imperfectly. But then I shall know and understand fully and clearly, even in the same manner as I have been fully and clearly known and understood by God. So although we don't really see clearly now, the word of God reveals to us several things about heaven uh, that we can at least get some comprehension, some idea uh, of, of where we're going and considering events present and uh, past and most recent, that's, I think that's really motivated me to talk about this, uh, uh, motivated to share some of this with you this morning because we have a tendency to think heaven is just for those who are about to pass on and we equate that with age, you know, or, or old age and disease and that type of thing, but that's not true at all because heaven's our home and any one of us could go there at any given moment. You know that's true, right? So there is no guarantee here on this, this temporary. So, so heaven's relevant for all of us. First of all, uh, to understand heaven, we've got to understand what is death when we talk about death. And also understand that most of us are not afraid of death. It's the dying part we're afraid of. 
So get, the, get and I'm finding that to be very tangible and realistic in the people I'm dealing with. It's not death, it's the dying part. So, but what is death? Death is the departure of the soul and spirit from this physical shell, from this body. That's what death is. Rachel is an example in Genesis 35, 18. And it came about as her soul was departing, for she died. Or how about Genesis 25, 8? Then Abraham's spirit was released. And he died at a good, ample, full old age. And then there's Genesis 25, 17. And Ishmael lived 137 years. Then his spirit left him, and he died and was gathered to his kindred. So that's describing our spirit and our soul leaving our body. The King James Bible depicts this as, you've heard this, giving up the ghost or yielding up the ghost. You've, I hope you've heard those terms. Acts 5.10. Then she fell down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead. And of course, the ultimate example that, uh, that I think we have is out of Luke chapter 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. So death is the departure of the soul and spirit then, biblically uh, understood, uh, empirical evidence there, uh, from the physical body. So we also know from Scripture then, when death happens, Scripture talks about that as sleep. You've read, I hope you've read that. Is it, so what does it mean to sleep then, especially to sleep in Jesus? And this is a very specific reference to those who are born again from above. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 15. This is education here this morning. This is a Professor Jerry sharing the Bible with you. But you know, we, we, this is good. This paints a really good image for us. Uh, now also, we would not have you ignorant, brethren, about those who fall asleep. In death, that you may not grieve for them as the rest who have no hope beyond the grave. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will also bring with him through Jesus those who have fallen asleep in death. For this we declare to you by the Lord's own word, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall in no way proceed into his presence or have any advantage at all over those who have previously fallen asleep in him in death. Sleep in Jesus. This sleep in Jesus also refers to the temporary nature, and I hope you get this, the temporary nature of death for, for us as believers and the state of our physical body only. Our soul and spirit does not go to sleep. Our physical body does, our outer shell. John 11, 11, he said these things and then added, our friend Lazarus is at rest and sleeping. But I'm going there that I may awaken him out of his sleep. And we just talked about 1 Thessalonians 4, and that directly confronts this also, sleep. So, that, so falling asleep in Jesus is when your body goes to sleep and does not wake up. When that happens then, what part of us uh, is with Jesus Christ then. When that happens, when our body goes to sleep, what part of us is with Christ? Again, 1 Thessalonians 4.14, our spirit and soul go to be with the Lord. We will be present with the Lord when that happens, when, when our body goes to sleep. 2 Corinthians 5.8, yes, we have confident and hopeful courage and are pleased rather to be away from home and out of the body and be at home with the Lord. This is all, see, so, so you've suspected this stuff, you've thought this stuff, here's the scriptures to back you up. Here, here's what the Bible teaches. We will also be in a far better state, which is good news, you know, because some of us haven't even been in a good state. But we'll be in a far better state. Uh, uh, Philippians 1, 20 and 23. This is in keeping with my own eager desire and persistent expectation and hope that I shall not disgrace myself nor be put to shame in anything, but that with the utmost freedom of speech and unfailing courage, now as always heretofore, Christ the Messiah will be magnified and get glory and praise in this body of mine and be boldly exalted in my person, whether through or by life, or through or by death. For to me, to live is Christ. His life is in me. And to die is gain, the gain of the glory of eternity. 
If, however, it is to be life in this flesh and I am to live on here, that means fruitful service for me. So I can say nothing as to my personal preference. I cannot choose, but I am hard-pressed between the two. My yearning desire is to depart, to be free of this world, to set forth and be the Christ, for that is far, far better. So our body goes to sleep, our soul and spirit go to be with the Lord. Well, if it's just our soul and spirit, are we the same person then? Uh, Luke 9, 28 through 31 clearly indicates uh, the, through visual aid that Moses and Elijah were recognizable and they maintained their identities. Somehow, somehow, uh, and I don't pretend to understand that, Abraham and Lazarus uh, uh, maintained their identities too. You can read about that in, in Luke chapter 16, 19 through 23. All these should be in your, in your bulletin. We clearly maintain our identities then, but we'll also be like Christ which we read just a little bit ago, which if you think about it, that's how we're supposed to be on this planet. It's training for heaven. Yes, I'm Jerry, but I'm also to represent and be like Christ. Be the same way in heaven, which if you think about it, uh, you can find that in 1 John 3, uh, 1 through 2. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. And such we are for this reason. The world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. You know how we always talk about, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. No, I don't think you will. I really don't think you will. You're going to be like, you're going to be as him because you're going to be like him. You'll see him and you'll be just as he is. And all the questions are just going to be gone. It's not that you'll know everything. You're just not going to care. It, it, different mindset. Okay, so if that's the case then, what will we know? What will we know when we get there? We will evidently know each other. That's, that's pretty evident, especially if you consider the comfort of meeting together, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4 a little bit ago, or even the comfort of David that he alludes to uh, in 2 Samuel 12, 23. But he's talking about his son. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him. So it's inferred that he's going to know when he goes. He's going to know who his son is. And we quoted earlier from 1 uh, Corinthians 13, 12. We will know perfectly what we know. That's interesting. We will know perfectly what we know. We will not know everything because that's not who we are. We're not God. God, God will know everything. He continues to know everything. And that is his exclusive attribute. But what we know... We'll know perfectly. Those kind of people you don't like here on earth, do you? <laughs> they just know it. But we'll also evidently have limited knowledge of earthly events. That's always a big question that people ask me. Well, I know what's... Because, you know, Hollywood has painted a different picture of who we are after we go to heaven. There, You know, they paint this picture that we go there to get wings, earn wings, and flap around and come back as a guardian angel. And, pff, wrong. That's, that's pure Hollywood, pure Hollywood. So don't expect that. Know that right now. When you go to heaven, that's not what's going to happen. A far, far better thing is going to happen for you. But evidently, we'll have limited knowledge. And I deduce this from Luke 15, 10. Even so, I tell you, there is joy among and in the presence of the angels of God over one especially wicked person who repents, changes his mind for the better, heartily attending, uh, amending his ways with abhorrence of his past sins. There's joy. There is a party going on when somebody is born again in heaven. Well, we're going to be in heaven. We're going to be among and in the presence of angels. So we're going to know they're not just partying just to have a party. They're not rejoicing just to rejoice. So we're going to have at least that knowledge. We're going to, in heaven, we're going to know when somebody's born again on earth because the angels will be rejoicing over it. Does that make sense to you? That's, that's where I deduce that from. Now, beyond that, I got no clue. I got no clue. I don't think anybody else does either. They may tell you differently. but So you think about that. Okay, your body goes to sleep. Your soul and spirit goes to heaven. Well, then what happens at the resurrection then? I, sometimes we get confused. We, we, we equate the resurrection with our death, and those are two separate events. 
Resurrection is different uh, than when we just go to heaven. Jesus is going to return to earth with us. If we're in heaven, we get to come back with Jesus. Can you imagine that? A whole army of us coming back with Jesus when he returns. I'll probably do that noise, probably. I don't know. I don't know. But our bodies then will be resurrected at that time and glorified to last forever. What an amazing thought. It's like, a, a I don't know, an adventure, drama, science fiction movie come to life. 1 Thessalonians 4.14, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will also bring with him through Jesus those who have fallen asleep, we just talked about this, in death, we get to come back at the second coming. It's not just Jesus. We're, if you've gone to heaven, you're coming back with him. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 through 54, And just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so shall we and so let us also bear the image of the man of heaven. But I tell you this, brethren, flesh and blood cannot become partakers of eternal salvation and inherit or share in the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable, that which is decaying, this body, inherit or share in the imperishable, in the immortal. Take notice, I tell you a mystery, a secret truth, an event decreed by the hidden purpose or counsel of God. We shall not all fall asleep in death, but we shall all be changed, transformed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet call, for a trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, free and immune from decay, and we shall be changed, we shall be transformed, Formed for this per perishable part of us must put on the imperishable nature. And this mortal part of us, this nature that is capable of dying, must put on immortality, freedom from death. And when this perishable puts on the imperishable and this that was capable of dying puts on freedom from death, then shall be fulfilled the scripture that says death is swallowed up in victory, utterly vanquished forever in and unto victory. Amen. Wow, can you just imagine that? Just imagine that. So, so there's a whole lot that we get to experience. Uh, and we won't have a, con uh, a concept of time. So it's not like it's going to be, well, when we're going back down to earth, this is really, you know, what do we... We won't have a concept of that. There, there'll be no time. And we can't really grasp that right now. But we'll be outside of time and the limitations of time. What else? Well, there are three different heavens discussed in the Bible. Three different ones. First, you have the, the uh, atmosphere that we have just above our earth, uh, the clouds, the air, et cetera, et cetera. Second, then you have the stellar heavens, which are, consist of the planets, the stars, and uh, all that good stuff that we're certain we try to get up there and check it out. And then finally, you have the third heaven, which, which the Bible specifically talks about. The third heaven is where God's throne is. It's the place that Jesus called paradise. It's where the saints of God are waiting. The ones who have fallen asleep, they're waiting for the resurrection of their bodies right now. We know that heaven is always referred to as up. Throughout scripture, always referred to as up. We know that there's no stairway leading there. Good song, but, but and there may be a dream about it, but there's actually no stairway leading there. If that'd be the case, there'd be a bunch of people climbing, you know. Uh, there are some type of windows, this, whether this is just a uh, symbolic or metaphoric, uh, it could be. But there's some type of windows because when you read scripture, the windows are always spoken of as being open. The windows are always open to pour out stuff from God. Always in scripture. Sometimes blessings are poured out. And you can read about that in Malachi 3.10 and 2 Kings 7.2. Sometimes curses are poured out. As in Isaiah 24.18. Sometimes uh, the, the same thing that's a blessing to one person is a curse to another person poured out from the windows of heaven. As in Genesis 8.2. But they're always open and something's always being poured out. There's always some kind of door. There's also some kind of door in heaven. And there again I'm emphasizing it may be just a symbol or maybe part of a, a metaphor but the, John tells of this experience in Revelation 4.1 after this I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven so 
There it is. And the first voice which I had heard addressed me like the calling of a war trumpet and said, come up here and I'll show you what, may, what must take place in the future. So the first thing John saw when he went through that, that door was a throne, God's throne. And even attempting to describe that is ludicrous, but, but we're given some hints. We're given some clues as to visually what, what it's like. Uh, God's throne, God sitting on his throne, and it's described as jasper, uh, sardon stone, or, or if you're familiar, emerald. It's that, that, that's how it's described. It's hard for the finite mind, I think, to grasp infinite things. And we cannot imagine the beauty and the radiance of Almighty God. But the scripture tries to. And the most fabulous jewel on this earth, the most fabulous jewel on this earth is dirt compared to God. Which is wow. It, behind the throne, if you can imagine, behind the throne is a sparkling rainbow. Uh, the 24 elders uh, clothed with glistening white uh, garments, and glistening. You see, ding, you know, a little start, ding, ding, glistening all over like that, you know. White uh, uh, garments and pure gold crowns on their heads. They're seated upon the, the 24 seats around the throne. And thunder and lightning proceeding out from the throne. Thunder and lightning from the throne. Can you imagine? And all these voices can be heard there. There's seven lamps that are set burning before the throne of God. And then, then if you look over not too far, the tree of life is actually there. Uh, the same tree was in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And, and on this tree grows 12 different kinds of fruit. Uh, each month, a different fruit grows out. Uh, the leaves are for the healing of all the nations. And the beautiful river of life is flowing out from under the throne. And pure water of life is freely accessible to anybody and everybody. And I don't talk about purified water. Oh my goodness. The streets are made of pure, transparent gold. See, the purest gold is not yellow. It's clear. It's like glass. You see through it. The crowns, that they talk about the elders wearing the pure gold crowns. They're clear, like wearing glass. You see right through them. And this suggests the elimination of any and all impurities uh, that we've experienced and, and been clouded with here on this planet Earth. All those impurities will be gone. And as John continued to look Look at that. He saw 12 gates of pearl uh, uh, outside, three on the north, three on the south, three on the east, three on the west, and 12 angels standing at, at these gates. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? That's what we're trying to do here this morning. A great host of angels, uh, probably a number we could not count, uh, messengers busy uh, serving God and carrying out every one of his desires. It must have been a great blessing for John just to get a glimpse of this. Uh, Stephen ha had been given a glimpse of this, but uh, as he expressed it, he, he died after being stoned. He spoke of seeing Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and they got so mad at that that they, he finally died before he could tell much of anything else that he was seeing right before God called him home. And Paul the Apostle got a glimpse of this on the road, Damascus Road. The vision was so bright, it was so gleaming in contrast to his sin that it blinded him. He later spoke about it to King Agrippa uh, in Acts 26, 19. Wherefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. It was so bright, it blinded him. Paul tells of a man that he knew that actually visited heaven. Actually, he called it, he went up, uh, ascended to the third heaven. You can read about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Enoch and Elijah were taken up into heaven. They saw it. They saw everything, but they never returned to tell us about it. Moses got just a small glimpse of God, his backside, and his face had shined and was shining so much that it scared everybody, and he had to cover it because they were all freaked, about, freaked out about the bright light coming out of his... They'd never seen LED lights before, you know, or or whatever, you know, the filaments and the lights that we have. And he had to cover his face. Uh, it's going to be an amazing thing to go there. Amazing. And see for ourselves. Second Corinthians 5.1. For we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, dissolved, we have from God a building, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 
There's going to be review. There's going to be records. There's going to be rewards. There's going to be rejoicing and a huge reunion. And I've listed all those scriptures for you so you can look that up for yourself. A lot of things going on. And again, I have to say we can only imagine. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I has not seen nor ear heard uh, uh, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love excuse me who love him got so much spit coming out of my mouth I can't swallow I'm just getting so excited because this is we're supposed to be praying on earth as it is in heaven so we're supposed to be aware of what that means there's our home is so outrageously awesome we can't even comprehend it can't even comprehend it. We get a new body eventually. Well, that's huge. You know, once you get to a certain point, you don't think about it much in, in certain years, but there gets to the point you think, oh man, I could use a new body this morning. But we'll get one that doesn't decay. Can, can you imagine that? We get to live in some type of custom built dwelling. In my father's house are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And we, we, get to, we get to eat great food. I'm, I'm sure, and I imagine we talk about this, we, you know, <laughs> conjecture, I guess, you know, chocolate without getting fat. Chocolate-covered cherry or whatever, you know. <laughs> but no cholesterol. We get to eat great food. We get to talk with people that we've read about from the Bible. We get to just hang with them. Now, can you imagine that? you imagine that? We get to see and speak with our loved ones whom we haven't seen. We get to actually be with them and talk to them. We get to live in a perfect place. We get to take part in the most awesome worship service that ever was and ever will be, and it will never stop. On a just worship, awesome worship, uh, nothing like we've ever seen, and we get a whole lot of no mores. And I've said this before, but it deserves repeating. We get a whole lot of no mores, no more tears, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more night, no more curse, no more hunger, no more thirst, no more Mondays, no more Southern Indiana weather up and down, hot and cold, no more bad guys, no more impure things, and no more no mores. I mean, I can only imagine that. I can, wow, I can only try to bring us into at least some small comprehension, and then we don't have, still don't have a clue. There's so much more that we could cover, but before I wrap up here, I just want, I want to cover one thing that I'm absolutely sure of, and I think most of you in this room are too. I don't know about those watching, but you can go to heaven without a lot of things, without health, without wealth, without fame. You can go to heaven without name, without learning, without any kind of earnings, uh, without culture, without beauty, without friends. You can go to heaven without a thousand things, but you cannot go to heaven without Jesus the Christ that's what it takes and it's so fundamentally simple but that's what it takes even the sharing of all this with you uh, it just doesn't do it there's still a concept I think that brings it home for me I'm going to wrap up with this uh, Henry Durbanville I don't know if you've read any of his writings but he has a book that's called The Best is Yet to Come what a, you got to read that look at it Henry Durbanville but in, in, in it he tells the story of a man who's a born again believer who believes in Jesus Christ he was dying excuse me and he was scared scared as we say scared to death he was scared of death this guy and I've been with many people that have that experience but he was scared of death and, and, and he was and really what he was scared of was the unknown well, one night uh, the doctor visited him at home, did a house call, and the doctor was a Christian, and the doctor felt, you know, helpless to comfort this guy. What do I tell this guy? You know, we, we know, we've read scriptures about heaven, and, and, but what do I tell this guy? He didn't know what to tell him, just to ease his mind and give him peace. All of a sudden, the doctor heard a scratching at the guy's front door and whining, and he opened the door, and in comes the doctor's dog followed him to the guy's house. You know, he comes jumping in the house, you know, and he accompanied and the doctor thought, ah, now I know what to tell the guy. Now I know what to say to him. He went to the guy's bedside and said, my dog is here. 
And I hope you don't mind, but my dog has never been in your house before. Had no idea what's inside this house. Didn't know what to expect. He didn't know what it was like in here at all. He just knew that I was in here. And he wanted in. I can tell you that I'm looking forward to heaven, not because I know so much about it, but because my Savior is there. And that's enough. That's enough. We don't have to know. We just know he's in there. And I'm scratching and whining at the door. Let me in. That's all we need to know. Our Savior is there. Amen. Musicians, if you'll come back. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Mm. I can only imagine.